Despite the high ceilings and plenty of space, the dark room felt incredibly stuffy to James. People around him were sitting too close to each other on all sides. Everybody talked way too loud for a closed room full of strangers, and the air was filled with the smell of a whole bunch of chemicals that most likely weren't good for anyone here. Yep, this was a bar all right. The music blasting through the air was odd and almost sounded oriental to his ears, although he of course knew that it must have been thought up by someone from a star far away from his home. He leaned back on the table, trying to see past Pippa and Moore, who, along with Quiss, had taken up position on the side of the table opposite to Shida, Curie, and him. For a bar that supposedly catered to all kinds of people, there sure were a lot of giant herbivores around. Tonight's establishment was, roughly translated, called Aguviad's Shade, and had been chosen by Pippa, who was adamant about going exactly here with everybody once she had heard about the night out. As nobody else seemed to have a specific preference as to where they would go, nobody made any objections, as Pippa guaranteed that this place would have something for everyone. And at least going by the menu, that much was true. At least they did offer food and beverages for all kinds of dietary needs around here. Oh, he just can't be serious, James heard she to say from his right, her voice piercing for the music. At this point, I have to respect the audacity, James answered, chuckling. He knew exactly who she was referring to without having to look. As was the case everywhere, his shadow had, of course, also followed him to this place, confirming that poor Reprieve apparently did not get vacation for their time on the station. The overgrown rodent had taken position a few tables over, and tried his absolute darndest to appear casual. Well, there's no way he can hear us from over there, so we should probably just let him be, James concluded, not in the mood to really deal with the problem at the moment. Fine, Sheeta murmured, pulling her gaze away from the stalker. But I don't speak for what High Sheeta will do. I take no responsibility for her actions. It was supposed to be an innocent joke, but James quickly noted that the thought of an inebriated Shida not being able to control her actions didn't seem quite as funny to some of their companions. James decided it was time to quickly change the topic. Honestly, I am just surprised that you are the only one around who doesn't drink alcohol, he said, leaning forward onto his knees. Shida scrunched up her face. I'll leave the fermented fruit juice to you herbivores, thank you very much, she said dismissively. It was true, though. To his surprise, the locality actually served a wide array of alcoholic beverages, most of them made from many kinds of fermented fruits with pretty low percentages, but alcohol nonetheless. Actually, I do not drink alcohol either, Curie said from his other side, making them turn towards him. Right, I'm sorry, James said, looking at their empty eyes staring back at him. Actually, he had just kind of left Curie out of the equation completely. Pippa shifted her head on the other side of the table, throwing a doubtful look at Curie. No offence, Curie, but do you drink at all? She asked, looking Curie up and down. James assumed she was trying to find a mouse somewhere on the metal surface. Curie shifted their body to look directly at Pippa before answering. My remaining organic components still do need water and sustenance just as yours do, they explained in their typical toneless manner. I just want to keep toxins of any kind as far away from them as possible. Right, Pippa replied with a doubtful look, apparently still trying to figure out how Curie would even manage to drink something. Almost right on cue, a waiter neared them, carrying their orders in the last tray that they held stretched far above their head with one arm. Instead of handing every person their own drink, like it was usually done on earth, they merely put the tray down on the middle of the table, letting everyone pick their own order from it themselves. Apparently James needed to relearn some of the galactic measurements he used less often, as he had thought what he ordered would equate to about half a litre. Instead, his drink had the size of a small bucket, filled with an ember-coloured fluid with chunks of ice almost the size of tennis balls floating around in it. He would probably be drinking that for the entire rest of the evening. Moore and Pippa took quite similar bucket glasses off the tray, while Curie, Quiss and Cheetah or we managed to order much more sensibly sized drinks. Along with the drinks also came an array of other orders some of his friends had made. Shida took something off the tray that looked like an extremely crudely made stuffed animal, while Moore and Quiss each grabbed something that looked like an ashtray made of glass, 
complete with plumes of thick, white smoke slowly rising from it. Once the tray was empty, the waiter, who had so far stood next to the table, constantly eyeing Curie with a mixture of curiosity and abject horror, quickly picked it up and uttered, Enjoy yourselves, before hurriedly speed walking away from their table. Some of the group quickly thanked him, others didn't bother. Then, Moore and Quiff both took a deep breath of the thick smoke coming from the weird glass containers, keeping it in for a moment before slowly and relaxedly breathing it out in long plumes. The smoke made the air smell almost like burned incense. However, James is more interested in the weird thing that Sheeta was holding. She was turning the strange, toy-looking thing in her hands with a look of anticipation on her face. What's that you got there? he asked, eyeing the item curiously. Do you have some Mievas? Sheeta answered with a cheeky look, not clearing up anything in the process. James turned his head and held out his hand. Can I have a look at that? he asked ingenuously. Sheeta looked at him distrustful for a moment before shrugging and putting the item in his hand, commenting, Well, I guess you are the one paying for it. James inspected the item. It was about the size of his fist and made of rough cloth, crudely stitched together into the vague form of some small animal. It was tightly stuffed with something that felt like tea leaves to him. You're supposed to smell it, a curious synthetic voice informed him from his left. He looked at their mask-like face for a moment confusedly, before returning his attention to the item and slowly lifting it up to his nose. It smelled like... Valerian, really? He surprisingly thought out loud, putting the thing away from his face and looking at it unbelievably. Shida, of course, wouldn't know what Valerian was, but she seemed to at least pick up on his tone, since she quickly snatched it out of his hands again, pulling it close to her chest. What? I also deserve something today, she said defensively, while nursing the item in her hands. Of course, whatever plant was stuffed into the thing obviously wasn't actually Valerian root, but it did smell a lot like it. He knew Miat was similar to cats from Earth in many ways, but this similar? Or could this be one huge coincidence with completely different kinds of pseudo-psychedelic plants for two completely different kinds of felines, just happening to smell alike to his limited nose? On the other hand, Valerian did also affect humans, so maybe it wasn't that weird after all. James merely lifted one hand now, stating, I wasn't judging, before turning his attention away from Shida. Lifting the unwieldy bucket of a glass with some difficulty, he took a long sip of the ice-cold beverage. It really tasted almost like apple juice that had been left lying around for way too long, although with a pleasant, tangy note in there. The drink certainly wouldn't become his favourite, but he could live with it for the night. Looking down at him while holding her own huge glass, Moore spoke up for the first time since they had made their orders. Getting ready, are we? She said in an audibly relaxed tone. Whatever that smoke was must have been some decently strong stuff. James took a deep breath. I told you I wouldn't try to get out of this, he said genuinely. Quiss let out one of their croaking laughs, while Moore seemed to be silently amused at how seriously James seemed to take what was essentially just a talk among friends. All right, who's first? James asked with a look around. Actually, I think you should go first. Pippa was the first to speak up, pointing at James with a hand she was holding her glass with. You're the worst offender after all, so you'll probably be talking the most out of all of us. It would only be fair to let you have a go before we get to interrogate you. James scanned the faces of his friends. Apparently Pippa's suggestion felt general support. He let out a sigh before taking another long drink from his glass. Putting it down again with a heavy clank, he said, All right then, here goes nothing. He raised his eyes towards Moore's huge face, looking into one of her dark eyes. I guess there is one thing I kind of have to ask you now, Moore, he said. Go ahead, the large woman replied, awaiting his question with a calm aura, her head lowering in James's direction to hear him a bit better in the loud room. James took another deep breath. So... Your children, he started, swallowing his trepidation. Who is their father? Are you married? Is he around? If so, when have you last seen him? You don't seem to be going home a whole lot. He stopped himself there, even though he could have carried on even further. It would probably be best to let her answer before going further down a path that might not even be close to reality. Moore made a soft, amused sound. Fathers, James. Fathers, she answered. I am a traditional woman. 
James looked at her dumbfounded. He wasn't the only one. Shida, and to his surprise Pippa, seemed to be just as confused as he was. Uh, not gonna lie, I'm getting some mixed messages here. James started hesitantly, trying to read anything on Moore's face. Moore shook out the long fur on her neck before she answered. I know it is not how many species do it, she started to explain, but we Raphaelites have never quite given up on our herd ancestry. Well, until we joined the community and adapted a lot of their social structures, that is. However, some of us still value our old traditions and live in large social groups together. And within those, structures are a bit different than you might be used to. My children were all fathered by three wonderful men I had known for all my life, and each of them was a wonderful father. For a moment, it was quiet. Well, what do you know? James could hear Sheeta mumble on his right. Well, I'm glad to hear that much at least, James said awkwardly, not really knowing how to respond to what he had heard. To him, it almost sounded like Moore was pretty wild in the past. With what James knew to be her form of a smile forming on Moore's face, the large woman said, Then I guess it is my turn now. James nodded and indicated for her to go ahead with a wave of his hand. He didn't miss the mood in the room changing slightly, as all eyes around the table fell onto him now. The song Plane had by now changed. The oriental music was replaced by something a lot more poppy, using a lot of fast drums. Moore tilted her head to the side so she could finally focus on him with one eye. Well, since we were already speaking of family, let us hear about yours, the large woman said encouragingly. He knew she left the question open on purpose so he could start with whatever he would be most comfortable with. However, in this case, that didn't help him at all. Oh boy, where do I even start? He said pensively, scratching the hair just above his temple while thinking. How about your uncle? He could hear Quiz suggest from the corner of his vision. You said you were raised by him. James shrugged in a way that was meant to convey as much as might as well. Well, yeah, he said awkwardly, not really knowing what kind of tone would be appropriate for talking about stuff like this. Once I was old enough that I didn't need to be breastfed anymore, my mother loaded me off on him. He raised me, and I lived with him until my late teens. He didn't know how deep into detail he should go, figuring giving them a vague sense of his situation would probably be enough. Pippa was the first to interrupt him while talking. So, your mum just did you as soon as you were out of the pouch? She asked, sounding both disbelieving and upset at the same time. You mentioned something like that before, Mora asked softly, while looking at James intently. James awkwardly looked around, trying to find the right words, and finally opted to take another drink before talking. Well, not exactly, he admitted, his hands awkwardly wandering along his neck and arm, trying to find something to do with themselves. She was always around, periodically at least. I saw her often, and when I was a child, we got along with each other well enough, she just had no interest in raising me. He stopped there for a moment. He could have kept talking, but somehow he wanted to wait for a follow-up question, his gut telling him that would make it easier to continue, as he felt a queasy feeling coming up. The one to finally speak up was Moore, her large frame shifting, as she started to sit more upright from her previously slashed position. How cruel, she said, and James could see on her face that she must have been thinking about her own children at that moment. You must have wondered why she would do something like that. James looked away from her face and locked his eyes on the table before him, sinking his head while shaking it. Oh no, I knew exactly why she did it. That was never a secret between us, he confessed with a strained voice, his hands now finally opting to tightly wrap around the ice cold glass of his drink. She is an ambitious woman, and she was pretty young when she had me. A child would have been in the way of her career, so she only did the bare minimum to get me into this world, and then gave me to someone she knew would take care of me, just as he had taken care of her when she was young, since, ironically, she didn't have great parents either. On a purely intellectual level, I completely understand her decision. The only thing I ever had to wonder is why she chose to have me at all. The last sentence set a bit of a damper on everyone's mood, he could tell. Good question, Pippa murmured under her breath earning her an abhorred look from Moore. He was still focusing on the polished surface of their table. If you know all of that, 
A voice to his left now rang out, its synthetic voice piercing through the white noise of the bar. Why are you so upset about it? A cruel question, really, James thought. Of course, he knew Curie didn't mean it in that way. They were just doing their name honour, being genuinely curious, but it still stung. His mouth twitched a few times before he could muster himself enough to answer. I don't know, he said earnestly, trying to suppress any emotion in his voice, although a small quiver remained. If I am being honest with myself, I know my life wasn't that bad. Hell, it could even have been cushiony, if only I were less stubborn. And I honestly would have to thank my mother for that. But still, even knowing all of that, every time I think about it, I just get angry. And the worst part is, I don't even know why. I understand my mother. I understand the decisions that she has made, so why do I still feel like I may hate her? He could feel emotions swelling up within him as he spoke. Usually he wouldn't have given a damn and just vented all of his frustration out. God, would that have felt good right then. But sadly, this wasn't a place to cry and scream. So he bit his tongue and pushed it back down. Still looking down, he suddenly felt something bump against his shoulder. Sheeda said nothing. She immediately let her head sink down, leaning it on James's shoulder while still fidgeting with the small, stuffed animal. It wasn't much, but it was enough to pull him the slightest bit out of his funk and stop the waterworks from running. He finally looked back up again. Curie seemed to be processing his answer while more quietly reprimanded Pippa, presumably for her tactlessness. Going around the table, his eyes landed on Quiss, their empty gaze staring back at him. What about your father? They signed. And while they looked at him, he felt that they had an almost candid expression. Was he finally starting to be able to read them? He let out a relieved breath. Luckily, that was a much simpler topic. Not much to say about him, James explained, causing everyone who hadn't noticed Quiz signing to him to turn towards the conversation surprisingly. He's some soldier from England who gave me nothing but my name and hair colour. I have spoken to him once. He apologised and it meant absolutely nothing to me. Other than that, he had the decency to stay out of my life. It was weird that he felt so much less about the guy that had actually abandoned him than about the woman who only kind of did. But in the end, maybe it was exactly as he had said. Maybe it was because she didn't have that exact decency to just stay away. And that is all you know about him? Pippa pried further, earning her another evil gaze from Moore. James nodded. As far as I'm concerned, Flynn is my father. That man is nothing but a stranger to me, he said in a serious tone, making sure to leave no doubts that he meant what he said. That sentiment seemed to connect with some of the people at the table more than it did with others. Moore probably wouldn't admit it, but he could see that she still contemplated the position of his mother. She probably imagined what it was like to just be left by the father of one of her children. However, the reactions of two of his other friends were a lot more interesting. Since it should be my turn again, James said, slowly managing to suppress his last bits of emotionality for the moment, which would probably come back to bite him later. I'm guessing from your reactions that I'm not the only one who experienced something like this. As he said that, he looked back and forth between Sheeda and Curie, who both had seemed to sympathise with his feelings towards his begetter in a way. Both seemed hesitant to say something. Curie especially didn't seem to like eyes being on him, although James would have figured they would be used to that by now. Taking a quick look over at Curie, who had started to slightly sway in place as they always did when they got stressed, she decided. I never knew my parents, she said tersely, not looking at anybody while she spoke, although James could feel her press against him ever so slightly harder. I grew up in an orphanage in Nyanteca. Being right in the middle of a big city, it was of course dirt poor and surrounded by the scum of society, so we somehow had to get by as a bunch of abandoned brats who hated each other's guts. The housemasters were paid to keep us alive, but not to keep us in check. Most of us turned to the people around us and were taught to steal and swindle like the pros. Most of them are probably still there in the slum. While she talked, James could see her claws dig into the cloth of the stuffed thing, making some of the finely minced roots inside it trickle out. She brought it to her face and took a deep nosefall before she continued. However, I was smart enough to realise that that life sucked, so I decided to get out of there, she recounted and there was some spiteful pride in her voice. 
Of course, being a stupid brat with no money, there was almost no chance of that happening. But almost no chance was good enough for me. And I learned that there was at least one place I could manage to go without any money. I only needed to grind my claws to the quick in the process, and I did. Her hand squeezed down on the stuffed animal, making more of his innards trickle onto the table. The galactic military had a remote outpost in the Unteka, and I could sign up for their forces there. It took training and study until my mind and body were numb, but I made it. I was accepted as a cadet on the Galactic Community Expedition ship. It's a shitty job working with people that hate me, but damn it, it is better than the slums. And I at least know I have earned being where I am. And if I keep doing so, I can climb high enough in the ranks that I can leave all of this behind as well. Get my own ship and show everyone exactly where they can stick it. She triumphantly rose up from her leaning position lifting the punctured sack of roots into the air like some kind of trophy, before sinking back down. James gave a small golf clap at her performance, and once she had sunk back down, he rubbed the back of his hand against her arm, enticing her to lean against him again. Moore, who seemed to be getting increasingly concerned by the rising number of absent parents, looked down at Sheeta with an expression James hadn't yet seen on her while regarding the feline. Do you have any idea why they left? She inquired with a gentle tone. None at all, she'd reported, while taking another deep whiff of the root scent. I really have nothing to go by, although if I had to guess, a kid was probably just too expensive for their taste. Moore now also seemed to need another lungful of whatever weird smoke she was inhaling over there. She let the substance leave her body as two long smoke trails coming out of her nose, from where it slowly floated above her horns, almost giving her the look of a large, furry dragon. It was by now clear that she held back with sentiments of empathy and apologies, which was something that James could appreciate. Having apparently taken in enough of the root scent to lift her spirits moment by moment, Sheeta looked around, loudly proclaiming, Okay, my turn. She shot back up from James's shoulder again, despite having just settled down, and looked him dead in the eye. So, it was you and your uncle against the world, huh? She summarised with her ears perking up focusing completely on him just like her gaze was, while her tail swayed through the air. Now I want that story of you kicking ass you hinted at earlier. She seemed very eager to get to know more about his more troublesome side. The other people at the table, who of course hadn't witnessed his early display, leaning closer once more, listening interestedly to what it was Sheeda may be alluding to. All right, I'll tell you. James said with another sigh, which probably wouldn't be the last one for tonight. While he never felt like he did anything really wrong in his youth, he wasn't exactly proud of it either. Once again drinking to try and gain some confidence, he admitted, but for that I first had to tell you a bit about my sister. Sheeda tilted her head, looking confused for only a second, before her mood swung back around and she excitedly asked, Right, Nia, where did she enter the picture? Whatever that stuff was she was sniffing there, it seemed to work quickly. To his own surprise, he also felt the early onset of inebriation creeping up on him. Had he drunk that much already? This stuff wasn't that strong, and he usually was a pretty steady drinker. Shaking off the oncoming haziness in his mind, he started to tell the story of him and his sibling. Alright. First you have to know that Earth, as one might expect of a death world, isn't exactly a nice place. At least not everywhere. Human governments get into fights and quarrels over all kinds of stuff, and sometimes things escalate. He started off his retelling, probably setting the mood for the rest of the tale. And when they do, people sometimes have to leave their homes. My home country has a long tradition of taking in those who have been driven from their home and giving them sanctuary. That is also what happened with Nia. He thought back to that day when they first met. It seemed like more than a lifetime ago. To even think that there once was a time that Neil wasn't around him sounded unreal today. He noticed that the music in the room had once again changed. The fast drums from before were replaced by something that sounded like the wailing of an amateurly played theremin. What was it with the music selection in this place? As the gazes around the table were still tightly locked in him, he continued. Her parents only had enough money to send one person that far of a distance, so they sent their child, hoping that she would be safe far away from the conflict, while they themselves took shelter in one of the neighbouring areas. I first met Nia during my late years of kindergarten, and we entered school together. We quickly became inseparable, 
as I got her used to life in my home and taught her what she needed to know. At least for a while, things were pretty simple. Maybe he was looking through rose-tinted glasses, but his childhood really seemed like an easier time. All the carefree days they had before, everything seemed to go colossally downhill. That sounds a lot more like the start of a romance novel than a tale of how you made a sister, Pippa commented. James also remembered Moore's first reaction, back when he had only hinted at their story. As he thought about it, it made sense that people would think that if they only knew the story the way he tended to tell it. Moore, whose heart would probably hit the floor soon if it kept sinking every time somebody was mentioning a parent-related tragedy, brought her massive hand up to her face and quizzically inquired, So, when did you decide that you would be siblings? It just kind of happened, James confessed, his mind wandering off, back to those days long past while he talked. Like I said, we were pretty much always very close. At some point, we just started addressing each other as siblings, and we said that we would always watch out for each other like siblings are supposed to do. At first, it was just a childish thing, something we said for fun. But then one day, I had to put my money where my mouth was and make good of my promise. With a look clearly saying, things are getting good, she'd have righted herself up, fixating James with a predatory gaze. The giants, Moore and Pippa, leaning closer, having to support themselves on the table. Quis and Curie scuttle a slight bit closer to him, with Curie especially seeming to eye him intently. James took a deep breath. While this wasn't something he had as hard of a time telling as his own story, he actually liked telling this one a lot less. Things change for Nia. It is not my place to talk about it, so I'll leave it at that. It is a part of her life that she has left behind her, and she wants it to stay that way. And I respect that. All you have to know is that things changed for her, and she changed. And with her, so did her relation to her parents. He explained, filling his hands slowly clench into fists as he talked. He would have to try harder to keep his voice and emotions in check. After that, it became clear very quickly that she could never go back. She was at the end of her line. Her own situation was already taken a lot out of her, and now she was also stranded, without anything to go back to. So, it was time for me to step up and be the best damn brother I could be. Sheeta crawled up closer to him with a cheeky look on her face. Is this where violent James comes in then? She cued, getting her head really close to his own. Wait, was she purring? It was hard to hear over the loud noises of the bar as well as the music, but James felt like he could hear the soft, vibrating sound in the air. Hey, I also did a bunch of nice stuff during that time, James insisted, looking her in the eyes before turning back towards the rest of the group. But yeah, this is also where a lot of my bad habits developed. Nia was having hard enough of a time already, after all, and I wasn't going to let anyone give her any shit for it. And I will admit that I sometimes went too far in my endeavours. You got into fights over your sister? Quiz signed, apparently having trouble imagining James lashing out at someone. I did, James replied, awkwardly rubbing the back of his head. Developed a real protector instinct back then, and haven't gotten rid of it since, although I mostly have it under control now. It only comes out anymore when someone is trying to get handsy. While he had explained, he had taken more sips of his drink every now and then, surprisingly emptying almost half of the bucket glass, and by now he could really feel the stuff going to his head. By now he also had an idea why that was. It was the thin air that was turning him from a steady drinker into a lightweight. Also, the weird mixture of smoking chemicals in the air probably did not help either. Well, I think you did the right thing, Piva said getting her paws up in a mocked, boxing position. When somebody messes with family, you show them what for. James shook his head amusedly, which was a bad idea since the room didn't stop shaking when his head did. He brought a hand up to his forehead as if to physically try to hold his hazy vision in place. Say, why were people giving your sister problems? Moore butted in, hesitating a bit, apparently disapproving of both James's choice of words and Pippa trying to edge him on. Well, she's different, was all he could say about that in a sad tone. And some humans really have a problem with people being different. They are in the minority, but sadly that makes them ever more importunate. And every now and then, they get bold enough to try something, which is where I had to step in. Shida chuckled giddily next to him. Sounds like you were a real hero back in the day, she said, Woosley leaning forward and almost falling on top of him while trying to lean against his shoulder again. 
James embarrassedly buried his face in his hand. His head felt heavy, and he let it sink down in shame. Well, I certainly thought I was, he said, with a sheepish chuckle. Sadly, rather than making me heroic, this made me lash out at the slightest provocation. Things really got out of hand, and suddenly before I knew it, I stood in front of the juvenile court. Naughty, naughty, Sheila murmured, while chuckling to herself and rubbing her head up against him. She seemed further and further gone with each breath of the route she took. Then what happened next? Quiz inquired, seeming surprisingly taken by his story. James stretched for a moment and tried to regain his senses before answering. Well, they let me off with a warning and social service, which wasn't much of a punishment for me, he answered, putting an arm around Sheeta to try and stop her from screwing around so much. But sadly, the law wasn't the only one who noticed my behaviour. Most of his friends looked at him confusedly, waiting for the grand reveal of this mysterious entity. However, one didn't need to wait. Quiz lifted her head slightly, as James could almost see the puzzle pieces falling in place inside of their head. They only signed two words. Your mother. James nodded expansively, his muscles not quite in the mood for a very restrained movement anymore. The candidate gets a hundred points, he said, with a wave of his hand towards Quiz. You're right. My mother wasn't fooled when she got the letter from the law, and being how she is, she decided to take matters into her own hands. He paused for a moment, sitting up straight again, as he had started to slash while he talked. For this, he had to concentrate again. Sheeda, who had slipped off of him due to his shifting, looked at him unhappily. She then decided, however, that his lap would be a much nicer place to rest on anyway, letting herself fall onto her side, and using him as a pillow while pressing the sack of roots to her nose. She suddenly turned up, telling my uncle that I would be living with her from then on, he explained, focusing his eyes on some glowing letters written above the bar in the distance. Luckily, I was almost of age around that time, so she really couldn't make that decision. Unluckily, I still needed her support if I wanted to keep up my studies, and so she proposed a deal. Military service, more mumbled, with a contemplative look on her face, letting one of her claws slowly glide through some of her fur. Yeah, James answered dryly. I do three years of service in the military, and for that, I get to study without worrying about any of the finances or logistics. I don't know why, I could have most likely managed to study even without her support, but I took it anyway. He paused for a moment to take a huge swig of alcohol, using it to flush down an oncoming wave of memories trying to block his throat. And let me tell you, he continued, wiping his mouth with his arm. Being in the human military when you have literally no business being there, not fun. And it didn't help that they wanted to quite literally put me through the ringer. Right after boot camp, it was special training. I got to play with the big boys, which is something that some of my fellow boots would have given their left eye for. For me, however, not quite as rewarding of an experience. But why even do that? Pippa asked tilting her head left to right to look at James with both eyes. To me, that sounds like an awful lot of work to put into someone you have no interest in. James bit the inside of his cheek. I said she had no interest in raising me, he clarified glumly. Once I was old enough to not need to be mothered anymore, things were getting different. Even if you wouldn't believe it, the fact that she has a son is something she finds a weird sense of pride in. However, for that, I also needed to be presentable. And since she didn't want to put the effort in to make me that way from the start, she'd apparently decided that the service would whip me into shape. He let out a single bitter laugh at that point, concluding, And the worst thing is, it worked. I got my act together after that, and even if I hated it there, the military taught me a lot. Not only about discipline and combat, but also about actually important stuff, like responsibility and actual dependability. Even about my own emotions. Never thought I would speak to that many counselors in three of my lifetimes. They did their job thoroughly, I'll give them that much. His companions exchanged some looks with each other, and he knew what they were thinking. That didn't sound too bad, and he agreed. Every time he told his story out loud, he thought the exact same thing. All things considered, it didn't sound bad. He had a loving home growing up. He got to do the things he loved pretty much all of his life. He had gone down a bad path and then got pulled out of it again. And lastly, he was even allowed to fulfill his dream, standing where he was today. All in all, he lived a pretty damn good life. But still, 
When he thought back on it in his head, that was just not how he could see it for some reason. Despite all the happy memories he held close to his heart, looking back, most things that he could remember were fights after hardships, after more fights. Bloody Knuckles here, Nia crying there. Flynn exhaustedly collapsing on the couch at afternoon, his old legs just not carrying him anymore. While he had to focus on their good times to remember them clearly, these were the pictures that played his mind constantly. His brooding was interrupted by a synthetic voice to his left. James, Curie carefully spoke up, waiting for him to turn towards them before they continued. Yes, Curie? He asked candidly, turning towards the cyborg and shaking off his funk. Curie's big red eyes seemed to focus entirely on him, even though there was no way of telling for sure. Was it worth it? They asked, in a really hushed, hesitant tone. Your sister, I mean. The change she made. Do you think it was worth all that? For a moment he was surprised. Then the most genuine smile he could muster crept across his face. Well, he said softly, the haziness clouding his mind clearing for a moment. It meant everything to her, and that makes it worth it for me as well. Someone is in love. He could hear Shida softly mocking in a sing-song voice on his lap. He stroked across her hair gently causing the inebriated feline to press against his hand with her head. Well, you're not entirely wrong, he said. I... I think I understand your sister. Curie spoke back up, their body locked into complete motionlessness, and their eyes staring to nothing. I can't be sure of that. I'm never sure if I understand people, but when I... changed, people also didn't like that I was different after that. 